Hi everyone, welcome to part 15 of my organ technology series. Today I'm going to be taking some viewer requests. We're going to talk about how articulation is achieved in organ tones using analog synthesis. We're going to talk about speaker systems and how they relate to analog organ systems. And we're also going to talk about Leslie or no Leslie. But first, take a look at this. On my YouTube channel, you will find a variety of video products, including my arts and entertainment video podcast, Other Stages. Other Stages features music, stories, and thoughtful conversations with guests from across the entertainment spectrum. Also on YouTube, you will find my music videos that feature my original work and the classical repertoire. The Organ Technology Series explores the fascinating ways in which organs have been built through history. You can sponsor my YouTube channel by joining me on Patreon, where you will receive exclusive Patreon-only content as a thank you for your support. You can also support my work at Venmo and PayPal, and you will always find these links in the video descriptions. My YouTube channel is not monetized and does not receive any financial support from advertisers. So just like PBS, I rely on people like you. Thanks. So when we're listening to a pipe organ, sometimes the pipes have chiff when they first speak, and sometimes they don't. And usually on classic organs, you hear a lot of chiffing when the pipes first speak, a lot of articulation in the sound. On theater organs, you hear a smooth on, smooth off character to the same types of pipes. And what causes that in pipe organs is, unfortunately this is too small to see on this camera, but um, there's nicking. There's, of course, the languid and the lower lip here, which creates an air sheet that runs past this upper lip. And it's just like blowing across a Coke bottle. And you can see that this one doesn't have chiff. It just comes on smooth and goes off smooth. And that's because of the nicking that is placed in the languid and lower lip. And that instead of having a nice air sheet, now we've got fingers of air, bugs, uh, going across. And that softens that initial attack that a pipe would normally have. On reed tone pipes, you also have something that's sometimes referred to as crack. There's this initial hit that the tone makes when the, the pipe comes on. So when we're building an electronic organ using analog synthesis, we have to figure out a way to do that. And it all comes down to something called envelope. If you've ever looked at a synthesizer like a Mini Moog, you have an oscillator, you have a filter, and then you have an envelope generator. And the envelope generator is labeled ADSR, attack, Decay, sustain, release. Well, what does that mean? So if we look at a diagram of an ADSR envelope generator, we'll see our baseline point and our starting point. And the attack refers to how high the signal goes before it peaks. The decay is how far down or how fast it comes down to a lower level. The sustain is what that level happens to be. And then our release is what happens after the key is let go of. So we press the key here. We reach our peak here. Based on how we've turned the knob, we come down to this point. Here's our sustain. Here's our sustain, and then when we let go of the key, our release. So if I set a long attack, it's gonna, I'm gonna hold down the key and the sound is slowly gonna come up. If I set a short attack, the sound is gonna go up quite rapidly. Depending on how I set the decay, that determines how fast it rolls down. The sustain is gonna t determine where it, it sits. And then when I let go of the key, we've got a release. If I have a short release, I let go of the key, it just pops right off. Uh, a long release, and it takes some time for it to head on down. So there are several kinds of basic envelopes. 
and they're called things like there's the piano envelope which we want our attack to come up strongly right away and then we want our decay to go down exponentially until we let go of the key and this creates that kind of characteristic piano sound where you hit the key it's a, a strong attack it drops rapidly at first but then slows down until we let go of the key there's also what's called the organ envelope and that's where we have an easy on a sustain and an easy off and then there's what we might call the xylophone attack which is more percussive and we have just a an almost instantaneous attack and then our uh, decay is very rapid and very kind of straight down. So this gives us a da. This gives us an ah. And this gives us a punk. And all of those envelopes are dialed in on a synthesizer. If we're on an analog organ, we usually kind of set it in with the circuitry. So this is the circuit for the piano keyer on my Rogers 33E. And if we look at this circuit and compare it to other keying circuits we've looked at before, we have a pretty typical diode gate circuit. We have our signal from the oscillator coming in here. This capacitor is a wave shaping so that what happens is our triangle wave is coming in and it gets turned into a sine wave. And then we go over here and we've got a couple of differences here between a normal just organ tone uh, diode gate and a uh, one for a piano tone. We have this little bit right here, which is kind of the key to the whole thing. We've got a capacitor here and a resistor to ground. And then we have these two circuits and this circuit creates kind of a drain situation and this circuit is a sustain uh, basically works like the damper pedal on the keyboard so what happens here according to the circuit description which is long and very involved and very complicated so I'm gonna to try to give you the bullet points here when we hit the key this capacitor charges up almost instantaneously this circuit creates kind of a drain on that capacitor so that the keying voltage goes from very high and exponentially tapers off so that the tone, the gate opening for the oscillator tone, starts out strong and then slowly fades away. This circuit allows that process to continue even after I release the key and so it works uh, like the uh, damper pedal and on the 33e I can use the sustain stop key which sort of just sets it in and it's going to happen regardless and then there's also a foot switch that's on one of the expression pedals that allows for uh, me to control it like I would control the damper pedal on a piano. So we strike the key, capacitor charges up, gives us a strong attack. This circuit causes the uh, keying voltage to drop exponentially down at whatever rate the value of the components allows and we get the piano envelope like this. Now normally uh, the keying circuit would just be this part back here and what would happen is we would get the smooth on smooth off scenario uh, of, of the gate uh, so if we look at this piano keying circuit and this stuff here especially what happens if we change the values in of the components in these uh, in this circuit well, we can get different envelope patterns. We could get this pattern here where we have a strong attack and then a good solid sustain and then a reasonable release when we let go. This would be good for a reed tone. 
a nice burst of sound at the beginning, then it sustains across, and then has a, a you know a release that isn't just all of a sudden. We could also get what I called the xylophone envelope, where we have a strong attack and a very rapid decay down to nothing. So we get just a little burst of sound, and that's it. So Rogers employed these envelopes uh, in various ways, depending on the tones that they were generating. So in one of my other organs uh, that I had previously, there was a single circuit board that did the trumpet, the oboe, and the string tone. And it had an envelope that was giving you that little burst at the beginning. And that was good because the string tone was kind of a solitional and smaller scale strings tend to have that little characteristic, a uh, little pop right at the beginning. And reed tones in particular have that. Then if you look at the situation with flute and diapason tones, now we have a different scenario. And typically, the, the flute and diapason tones themselves use that organ envelope, as it were, where it's an easy on, easy off. But it's combined with a couple of other circuit boards that are keying the oscillators and other parts of the organ's tone system. For diapason tone, to generate the chiff of a diapason pipe, Rogers used what they called a puff generator. And what happened there was you had a keying circuit that was connected to a white noise generator and it would give you that xylophone envelope, just a little pop of sound right at the beginning. And then that would run in parallel. So when I drew the diapason stop and I played a note, the diapason tone would ease on and right at that same time I would get that pop of white noise from the other circuit board playing in parallel to it. And then when you play the notes together, you get the articulation typical of a diapason tone. On flute stops, we did some, they did something a little different. Um, depending on, you had a, let me step back. You had a chiff generator and it again used that xylophone uh, style envelope where it was just a little pop of sound and it would play in parallel to the flute keyer, but it would key the note corresponding to the appropriate second or third harmonic. So let's say I draw a open flute, like a spitz flute or a traver flute, and I hit the key, the flute tone is easing on, and simultaneous with that, the shift generator is playing the note one octave higher, which corresponds to the second harmonic. So when you hit the key, you got that pop of the second harmonic tone and then the uh, fundamental tone playing underneath it. If I pull the stopped flute, like a Borden or a Rohr flute or a Gedeck, then what would happen is the flute tone would come on and the shift generator would play the note an octave and a fifth above the note that was keyed corresponding to the third harmonic and you would get that pop of the third harmonic tone and then the fundamental tones sustaining underneath it. It's interesting that on the Hammond organ the percussions were second and third, corresponding to the second and third harmonic. And in Hammond nomenclature, that would be the four foot and the two foot uh, draw bars. So those tones would be percussed and uh, you could get kind of the same effect, right? You'd be, you know, pull your eight foot draw bar, maybe just a skosh of the four foot, and then set the uh, percussion to that third harmonic and you almost had a chiffy tone of a stopped flute, more or less. So that is just the very basics of how articulation was achieved uh, using analog technology. Now, that's how Rogers approached it anyway. Uh, most of the 
analog organs that were sold in the 60s and 70s uh, were the home organs, and they really were modeled after theater organs. And so they really didn't worry much about articulation. They just wanted to not hear clicking and thumping when the organ was being played. And so using much simpler circuitry to generate much more basic tones. But those instruments were not meant for professionals to practice on or to be in a church somewhere. They were intended for just people to doodle with at home and have some fun. So the other viewer request was that I do something about speakers. And that is a long and complicated uh, story, and we're probably going to do several episodes that include stuff about speakers, because speakers, when it comes to uh, analog organ building, are really a very critical component. Having the right speaker with the right organ is fundamental to making that instrument sound like it's supposed to sound. So. Today we're going to cover just the basics, and so I shot this over in my living room a few minutes ago, so let's take a look. Okay, so here we have a pretty typical hi-fi speaker system. We have a woofer, in this case a 15-incher, we've got our mid-range cone, and we have our tweeter. Now, this really isn't a simple matter of just slapping some speakers of different sizes and tying them all together. One of the things you have to do here is segment the frequency ranges of each of the speaker cones. The goal here is to have a speaker system that's going to be flat from below 20 cycles and hopefully above 18 or 20,000 cycles so that when you're listening to music you hear the full spectrum nice and even. Now, what you have to do to segment these speakers is, you, well, you got to look at the specification sheets and you have to see what is the actual frequency response of each of the various cones. And when you look at a typical specification sheet, there's, sheet, there's usually a chart. It shows you a graph of where the speaker starts responding, where it becomes flat, if there's any spikes or uh, dips in, in the speaker's response. And what you try to do is find a set of speakers where there's a flat range on each of the speakers that kind of overlaps each other. Then you build a crossover network which isolates the frequencies that are appropriate for each of the speaker cones. So I don't know what the exact uh, crossover points are on this particular system. But just for the sake of discussion, let's say it's 500 and 4,000. That's a kind of an average for a system like this. So we're going to have some kind of filter that only allows frequencies from 500 below on the base cone, allows frequencies 4,000 and above on our tweeter, and the frequencies in between only on the mid-range. And then hopefully the end result is that nice flat response. So how do we do that? Well, we use capacitors and inductors. Capacitors will typically not, depending on the size of the capacitor, not allow a frequency below a certain point. So they're called a high pass filter because wherever their frequency cutoff is, they'll let everything above that through, but nothing below that. Inductors work in exactly the opposite direction. An inductor will only allow frequencies below a certain point through. Anything above that gets cut off. So our typical crossover network would be an inductor that's going to cut off at 500 cycles. That way only stuff 500 cycles and below goes into our woofer. Then we're going to have a capacitor as a high pass filter that will only allow frequencies from 4,000 up through here. Then we have to make a notch filter for our mid-range cone, and that consists of a capacitor that's a high-pass filter on the low point, and an inductor that's a low-pass filter on the high point, so that we have our uh, inductor that is the low pass filter that sends everything 500 below there 
Then we have a capacitor that sends everything from above 500 cycles into the mid-range cone. And then we have an, uh, another inductor that's going to cut off the mid-range cone at 4,000. And then we have a capacitor that's going to allow 4,000 and up into our tweeter. And hopefully the end result is that we get a nice flat frequency response with only certain frequencies going to certain speakers. Now, if you've ever played around with old analog electronic organs and you tried plugging an old analog electronic organ into a hi-fi speaker like this, you probably noticed that, oh my god, it sounds awful. And that's because in the world of analog synthesis, especially in organs, the speaker system was a big part of the filtering that went into making oscillators sound more like organ tones. So like I mentioned in that clip, you can't just stick a hi-fi stereo speaker onto an old analog organ, especially a Hammond, because the sound is going to be truly, truly dreadful. Now, back in the mid-1980s, I got a job at a little Catholic church that had been a mission for many, many years and had recently been made into a parish. And their first parish pastor wanted to start a music program and got a hold of me. And they were willing to pay decent money. And I went over there and all they had was a little old Hammond, really a home organ, but it was full size. It had two 61 note keyboards and it, a, a 25 note pedal board. And I thought, well, okay, as long as you agree, we're gonna get a new organ in the near future. Uh, I can go ahead and get started with this, but we are going to have to make some modifications. What I was looking at was that the PA system they had was strictly for voice. And I knew that the equalization curve of those column speakers would maybe work okay as a supplement to the Hammond's internal speakers. So I had my good friend Joe Cardoza come over and we figured out how to wire in a line level output on that organ. And then I plugged that into the church's sound system. And what I heard was clickety, 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 click. The key click of the Hammond organ was just brutal. So what are we going to do about that? Well, fortunately, the sound system at the church had a four band EQ on every channel and it had a good broad span on how much those EQs would boost or cut and what I ended up doing was boosting the bass almost all the way up the low mid was center the high mid was turned halfway down and the treble was turned all the way off and then it was okay well, why were we getting so much of that Hammond key click? Well, that's because the Hammond organ used a system where the audio signal off of the tone generator ran into these keys, uh, these uh, key contacts attached to the key. And so you would have like eight, four, two and two thirds, two foot. And then you would have buses running the other way. And when you hit a key, that went down and connected those pitches to the appropriate buses. And then at the other end of the bus, you have the drawbar connected so you control the loudness of each of the pitches, thus controlling the harmonic content of the tone you were getting. Well, anytime you have a mechanical contact on an audio signal, well, that's going to create a pop because they're going to arc. Back in 1935, when the Hammond organ was first built, this was the first problem that they had to conquer. And the way they did it was to select speakers that had a sharp roll off at the correct frequency. I think it was like around 6,000, I wanna say five, 6,000 cycles. I'll have to look that up. But at any rate, what they were trying to do was get above the musical range and get where that key clicking was 
where it was occurring in the frequency range and get that out of there, filter that off. So they selected the correct speaker cones that would do that, and then they enhanced that effect by building an amplifier that had that same curve. It would go up fairly flat until you got to that point where you were past the musical notes and you were into that key clicking, and then you rolled that amplifier off. And if you set up a Hammond organ with a Hammond tone cabinet, you got very little click. In fact, the click was so subdued that it sounded more or less like the articulation you would hear from a chiff generator on a Rogers organ. Well, this was the thing about all analog organs. The oscillators, when organs with oscillators came out, generated f harmonic frequencies that were far beyond what any organ pipe would generate. And so to filter that tone down to where it sounded more like a pipe, you could only do so much with the electronics available at the time. You know, we're talking 30s and 40s. You had to do the rest of it with the speakers. You also had other anomalies that would come up. Maybe you needed to boost the bass or suppress the mid-range. You did that mostly with the speakers. You selected speakers that were going to do what you needed to do. And this is why speakers with analog organs are kind of a fascinating topic. And I'm glad the viewer was kind enough to suggest this. I'll do a lot more detailed stuff, in particular on Hammond speakers, uh, the Leslie speakers that were first designed for the Hammond organs, and of course, because I have access to a lot of Rogers information, we'll take a, a careful look at their speakers and how they approached this problem of having to let the speakers do some of the filtering work to make the organ sound like an organ. Now, in the last episode, I talked a little bit about fixing up the Leslie speaker that went with my Rogers 33E theater organ. And I love a Leslie speaker on analog organs, whether it's a Hammond or a, a Rogers. And a viewer wrote in and they had heard that Rogers included Leslie speakers on their organs back in the 60s and 70s because they were very popular and uh, people wanted a Leslie speaker. So even though the Rogers organ didn't really need the Leslie speaker, um, they added them as a marketing ploy. And, I mean, that's a story I've heard, and it's quite possibly true. I mean, any manufacturer is going to look at anything that's going to make their organs sell better, right? Well, it wasn't just the theater organs that Rogers included Leslie speakers on. Leslie speakers were available for a lot of their classic organs as well. And it was for, initially, much the same reason that it was on the Hammond organ. Now, the Hammond organ, of course, using the tone wheels, they only had the one tone generator. So while the draw bars allowed you to get different tone qualities, you did not get that buildup of a multi-rank ensemble like you would on a pipe organ. Well, the same thing is true of analog uh, electronic organs as well. You don't have enough tone generators in place to get a good buildup of ensemble. And so the Leslie speaker was initially designed to make the Hammond organ sound more like an organ. And it also had the benefit of when you spun it fast, you could get the tremolo out of it. The slow speed gave you chorus effect, the fast speed gave you a, a tremolo effect. Now, if we look at how Rogers generated vibrato or tremolant in their earlier organs, it was a combination of vibrato and tremolo. Vibrato being a variation in pitch and tremolo being a variation in amplitude. Again, this goes back to the first Hammond organ, the Model A. Lawrence Hammond 
did not really have a musical ear, but he understood physics and mechanics just instinctively and was an incredible engineer. And so he could hear no difference between his single tone generator making a bunch of different sounds and a pipe organ of 30 or 40 ranks making a bunch of different sounds in combination. And so the need for that chorus effect was lost on him. When he looked at how the tremulant worked on a pipe organ, you have the regulator and then an air dump device that's spin, you know, bopping away and each time it drops, it lets a little air out of the uh, reservoir. So that causes the air pressure to go up and down, which causes the pipes to have both amplitude change and pitch change. Well, Lawrence Hammond, not really understanding music all that well, only saw that it was making an amplitude change. And so his first tremolo unit on the Hammond Model A did exactly that. And what it sounded like was that the organ was having its chest beaten. It was ridiculous. It sounded like nothing. And it took the engineers at Hammond a long time to convince Lawrence that we need to make both pitch and amplitude change. Rogers, in the 60s and early 70s to do this, used a system where one device would work on the oscillators to get their pitch to go up and down. And then another device at the output would create an amplitude change. And these devices were in sync with each other, and that created the characteristic tremulant that you get on a pipe organ. So if one is looking at those Rogers instruments as an imitation of a pipe organ, then yeah, the tremulant that they create with the combination of vibrato and amplitude change um, is perfectly fine. It creates a great result. And so you really don't need a Leslie speaker on a Rogers organ. For me, though, I like the Leslie speaker, and it's probably because much of my early training as an organist was on a Hammond, and I really got into that, you know, changing the speed on the Leslie speaker as a musical effect. I like the musicality of uh, a, a Leslie speaker, and I even like it on a Rogers organ. So ultimately, it really is a matter of taste because, no, the Rogers 33E doesn't need the Leslie speaker, and none of the classic organs really needed the Leslie speaker. But if you had an organist like me, I wanted it <laughs> because I felt I could do things musically with that the way that Leslie speeds up and slows down, there's a great musical effect you can get with that, and there's drama you can add to your performance with that, and so I think I think it's it's quite fun. Um, and of course, the other thing is that the the person who talked asked me about this, you know, Leslie or no Leslie, uh, the organ that he's restoring is much bigger than the 33E. It has more tone generators in it. So it naturally develops a better ensemble. It's a newer instrument than the 33E, and uh, it's just a better organ all the way around. And I think the vibrato and tremolo generators on that instrument are much more sophisticated than what's on the 33E. So yeah, he doesn't really need the Leslie speaker. And unless you just like it, there's no reason to keep it. Pass it along to somebody like me who wants it. So. All right, I know we covered a lot of ground in here, and I hope this has been interesting for everybody. Um, hey, always feel free to make comments and uh, send me ideas, and uh, I'll see what I can do about that. Uh, I've always having a good time putting these little videos together and talking about how organs work. Uh, my wife can tell you that I talk about this all the time anyway, so it's <laughs> that's the way I am. Anyway, thanks a lot for joining me today, and we'll see you next time.